we'll address them near the end of the uh, presentation. September is National Preparedness Month. And uh, since its inception in 2004, National Preparedness Month is observed each September in the United States. During September and throughout the year, New York City Emergency Management encourages New Yorkers to take steps to prepare for emergencies in their homes, their businesses, schools, and communities. Consistent with National Preparedness Month, this presentation is part of a series of New York City emergency management initiatives intended to provide vital tools and resources and educate New Yorkers about emergency preparedness. Now, uh, just a bit about our agency, who we are and, and what we do. Uh, New York City Emergency Management and, and the acronym is NYCEM, N-Y-C-E-M. NYCEM helps New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. The agency is responsible for preparing the city and coordinating emergency planning and, and response for all types and scales of emergencies. Uh, NYCEM makes certain that the other responding agencies and partners are communicating with each other. That's so important so that they can uh, provide the very best possible response. We collect and disseminate information uh, about preparedness and we educate New Yorkers about how to prepare themselves, their families, and even their pets for all kinds of emergency. Uh, we're staffed by more than 200 dedicated professionals with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise, even including individuals assigned from other agencies. Now, uh, Matt is gonna uh, share a bit more information, Matt. Hi, Ed, thanks. So yes, our uh, agency, New York City Emergency Management, uh, one of our biggest tasks is to educate the public about preparing for different types of emergencies, especially hurricanes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our programs that we have. So uh, some of them include the Ready New York program. This is a program that we have to speak about the hazards that may affect the city, and also to encourage people to prepare and put a plan together. Our CERT program has currently, this stands for the Community Emergency Response Team. We have 1,200 members, and they're trained in basic life skills such as fire safety, medical disaster operations, light search and rescue, and also traffic um, assistance. CERT members also help the public, they help their communities by assisting in emergency response and recovery. Our community preparedness program is a program that brings local community members together to promote grassroots emergency preparedness and volunteers, volunteerism. Our partners in preparedness program helps organizations prepare employees, services, and facilities during emergencies. Now, Ed's going to talk about personal preparedness. Uh, thank you, Matt. And, and I might just add that um, we're, we're talking about hurricanes right now. And each one of those uh, uh, parts of the agency that Matt just spoke about uh, is a vital, vital uh, part of our uh, informing the uh, uh, the public and uh, you know educating them and and uh, urging people to prepare for hurricanes. Everything that was mentioned so far, uh, it's, it's just vital steps that can be taken to prepare for hurricanes. Now there are three basic steps to preparing. Step number one, make a plan. Before that hurricane comes, before you even uh, 
get uh, any information that it might be on the way. You should already have your plan in place. You should know what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, how you're going to do it, what you're going to need, and, and uh, have that already in place. You should have rehearsed your plan, gone over it with your family, so that when that moment comes, you're not standing there like a deer in the headlights or you're, and you're not standing around terrified or confused. You have your plan in place, you implement it, and uh, you go right ahead. That's step number one, planning, making a plan for, for, for the hurricane before it comes. Step number two is gathering the supplies that you're going to need that will help to sustain you while that hurricane, uh, you know, is coming, while it's in progress, and even after it goes. And number step number three, get informed. You can, you know, there's so much information about this. And getting informed is, is, is your responsibility. This, uh, you know, I commend you for uh, participating in this presentation because this is one major way of getting informed about hurricanes and about what you can do to uh, prepare yourself and your family. You can get much more information and create your own emergency plan by downloading the My Emergency Plan booklet online. You go to nyc.gov slash ready ny and you select guides and apps you scroll to my emergency plan and you select from your choice of 13 different languages you can also find that link in the chat during the presentation now just a bit about um, hurricanes in new york city not not long ago just a few uh, uh, maybe a week ago week and a half ago we witnessed an unprecedented weather event two very very powerful storms converged on the southern united states hurricane laura made landfall in louisiana near the texas border with extremely heavy wind rain and wind gusts up to 150 miles per hour and a storm surge of nearly 20 feet. And we're going to talk about storm surge uh, just a bit later. Perhaps the largest storm surge in the Gulf of Mexico since uh, Hurricane Katrina in, in 2004. Mass evacuations were prompted by the threat of, this, of the uh, storm surge. New York City felt the effects as the storm moved north with, uh, and, and this is an example of how devastating hurricanes can be and how active this hurricane season still is. So we're not out of the woods yet. Very, very important that you go ahead and start preparing today. Don't wait today. The Atlantic hurricane season began uh, June 1st, and it continues through November 30th. And historically, though, the, the greatest potential for hurricanes here in New York City is from August through October. So again, we're still in the season. Uh, the National Oceanic, uh, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that's a mouthful, uh, their forecasters predict an above a normal season with uh, maybe 13 to 19 named storms, three to six major hurricanes. Now is the time to prepare. We've already experienced a fast start to the season with multiple named storms already. Now, just a quick question to, to everyone listening. What do you think causes the largest number of deaths during a hurricane, the largest number of fatalities? 
Now, just you won't be able to answer me uh, directly, but just think about it. How many people said the wind, the wind force? How many said the water? Well, you were both right. Remember we talked, I, I mentioned the storm surge before. The storm surge is a huge dome of water from the ocean that's pushed toward the shore by the wind force around the hurricane. And sometimes uh, that, uh, that storm surge combined with the, the normal uh, waves can cause extensive damage and flooding, and, and that storm surge uh, uh, can be up to 30 feet high, or even more in some instances. Now, that's as, hard, as tall as a three-story building. Imagine the force when it hits the shore and the kind of damage that it does. Now, Matt's going to talk with us a bit more about the impact caused by uh, wind, rain, and flooding. So, as, as Ed mentioned, um, you know, impacts of hurricanes can be, you know, wind, uh, rainfall, and flooding. So, for wind, uh, for hurricanes, usually sustained winds of 74 miles an hour or greater um, cause damage to buildings, trees to topple, and also can cause loose objects to be dead, deadly projectiles. Power lines can also be affected by the heavy wind where you may experience power outages. A recent example of this was Hurricane Isahias, which the city was affected where there was large scale power outages. So that is that's one example of how wind can play a role as far as impacting locations during a hurricane. In addition to that, rainfall, usually during hurricanes and tropical storms, there's widespread rainfall of six to 12 or more inches of rain, which can cause serious flooding. Areas that are low lying and also um, areas that are have debris in them, those are going to be the most vulnerable for flooding. In addition for flooding, um, what can happen is high, the rain levels can, the water can rise rapidly and this can cause flooding. This is flash flooding. So, when that happens, it's important to not walk through or drive through flooded waters, as this can be dangerous. It's important if you're driving not to pass through flooded waters. And if you do come to that point, it's important to find another route and go to that location. So we're gonna talk now about hurricane preparedness, and there are some things that you should consider. So first off, you should check the weather reports to see when the storm is going to impact your area. Also, you should determine if you live in a hurricane evacuation zone, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. For those living in homes or apartments, it's important to protect your property. I'm gonna talk about some steps you can take to do that. And they include you know, taking in lightweight objects such as lawn furniture and also garbage cans. Also anchoring down heavy objects such as barbecues or propane tanks. Also moving uh, objects that are valuable to higher level because basements are vulnerable to flooding. So if it's on a lower level, raising, putting, placing on a higher level uh, floor. And in addition, if you're in an evacuation zone, if you have a vehicle, it's important to move that to higher ground. So those are some steps for protecting your home and or apartment. In addition, if you live in a high rise building, the 10th, 10th floor or higher, it's important to stay away from windows because glass can shatter or break. Also, you should be informed of what your building's evacuation plan is. Also, if you are in a building, it's important to know when to evacuate. So evacuating as quickly as possible because elevators may be out. If you rely on them, elevators may be out of service and not available at all times. That's why it's so important to evacuate as quickly as possible. For people with disabilities and or access and functional needs, 
it's important to put a plan together. So having a support network is a key thing that people with disabilities would want to do. A support network are people that individuals with disabilities can rely on during an emergency. So this can include relatives, friends, neighbors, building management or service providers. So usually the support network is going to be relied on when an emergency happens, especially a hurricane. For hurricanes, if an individual with a disability has difficulty with evacuating prior to a storm, it's important for them they can call 311 for additional transportation assistance. For those using life sustaining equipment, it's important to contact your utility company to see if your life sustaining equipment qualifies you as that type of customer. So some examples of that would be a sleep apnea machine, possibly oxygen, or a portable dialysis uh, machine. So those are some examples of life sustaining equipment. In addition to, to that, people with disabilities should take additional steps to be prepared. And this includes allowing additional transportation time, also thinking of dietary and also medical needs. So some things you can include in your plan would be uh, an extra battery for those who use Life Alert or other batteries that are difficult to come by, maybe thinking that beforehand, also having glasses, um, extra items that are gonna be um, essential medical medications, if someone uses uh, an inhaler, if they have asthma. So these are additional items that someone with a disability would want to include. <clears throat> so next, um, Ed's going to talk about knowing your zone. Uh, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> um, you know, the, the uh, city of New York has six designated hurricane evacuation zones, one through six, and about three million New Yorkers live in these zones. It's easy to find out what zone you live in. Uh, you can call 311 or you can visit nyc.gov slash know your zone, K-N-O-W, your zone. Areas of the city subject to storm surge flooding are divided into six evacuation zones. Uh, based upon the risk of the uh, storm surge flooding, the city may order residents to evacuate depending on the hurricane's track and uh, forecasted storm surge. If someone is in a zone that is uh, COVID-19 positive, health and hospitals will contact that person to assist in providing shelter for them. Determine whether you live in an evacuation zone by using the hurricane evacuation zone finder, again, at nyc.gov slash know your zone or call 311. Hurricane evacuation zones, uh, you know, you may, uh, if, if you have to evacuate, make a plan to stay with friends and or family outside a hurricane evacuation zone. Uh, make sure you can appropriately social distance and no one in the family is sick or is recovering from COVID-19. Be sure to pack hand sanitizer and extra face coverings in your go bag. What's a go bag? We're gonna talk about that a little later. If you can't stay with friends or family, use the finder. Call 311. And now Matt is going to uh, continue. Thanks, Ed. So New York City has hurricane evacuation centers that one can go to if they cannot stay with family or friends. So the city has 60 hurricane evacuation centers throughout the city that people can go to if they don't have uh, access to family members or friends. So in those evacuation centers are also shelters. And we know that our shelter is gonna be, um, look a little different this year due to COVID-19. So I'll talk about that in a second. But um, first off, I wanna add also that for shelters, uh, we have accommodations for people with disabilities and there's uh, varying uh, accommodations that we do provide. 
So I'll go through them a little bit and uh, I'll also add information about service animals and pets too. So for people with disabilities, for those who are blind and low vision, uh, for shelters, there is orientation of the shelters provided beforehand, either in braille or audio format. And also if one goes to a shelter, there'll be uh, employees there to help with orientation of the shelter for someone who's blind or low vision. Um, also for someone who's deaf or has hearing disabilities, uh, we offer video remote interpretation, which is American Sign Language through a tablet, or assistive, lis assistive listening devices, those who have um, hearing disabilities. In addition to that, too, we have a stockpile of equipment. If people with mobility disabilities have to leave their apartment or home, they don't have their equipment, there is equipment such as wheelchairs, walkers, canes, and crutches that will be offered. In addition to that, too, we have signage that talks about power um, using um, power equipment, so priority to charging that equipment if one comes to the shelters. Also, there are refrigerators for medication, so if someone is diabetic or uses other medications, they can store them in refrigerators. So those are some of the accommodations, and our shelters are accessible for people with disabilities. There's signage throughout the shelter showing where the accessible locations are. There's also a pet-friendly room and also a quiet room for people who have developmental disabilities or uh, just need a place to stay for a little bit to um, if they're stressed. So those are some other locations in the shelter. Uh, for pets and service animals, we do allow pets and service animals during a coastal storm or hurricane. And um, pets are allowed. There's a pet friendly room, as I mentioned. And also for people who have service animals, we're not going to separate the person from their, uh, their dog. So that is the most important thing. And we do not provide documentation for emotional support animals or service animals because we want everyone to stay safe during an emergency. So those are some of the options that we have at shelters. Again, like I mentioned, we have people who are trained to be able to assist people with disabilities as we have etiquette training throughout the year at our office. Now for COVID-19, obviously the shelters, again, are going to look a little bit different and that's going to include social distancing, face masks, face coverings, and also cleaning throughout the shelters. So for social distancing, our shelters are going to operate at a lower capacity and there will be um, cots six feet apart from one another. In addition to that, those who come to the shelters will be screened, and if they show symptoms, they'll be moved to a separate congregate setting. Um, there also will be an isolation uh, location if someone does come to the shelter and then they show symptoms while there. Those are a couple other um, things we've added in, and also there'll be marking, markings and signage throughout the shelter talking about social distancing. In relation to face coverings, uh, all those who come to the shelter, the shelter staff, and also those who visit the shelters, they will be required to wear a face covering. And if you do not have a face covering, you can provide them at all locations. In regards to cleaning, Department of Education custodial staff, they will follow the guidelines from the Department of Health in regards to cleaning during COVID-19. So now Ed is going to talk about making a plan. Thank you, Matt. Um, part of everyone's plan, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about the importance of planning uh, just a few minutes ago, and, and part of everybody's plan should be creating what we call an emergency support network. And that that's simply said, it just, uh, you know, a group of people, at least one or two people, but as many as you like, who you can depend on to keep in touch with you during an emergency. Do not go through an emergency alone. That's the absolute worst. It can be terrifying. Ask at least two people to be in your emergency support network. It can be family members, friends, neighbors, caregivers, co-workers, or members of community groups. Remember, you can help and provide comfort to each other when that hurricane has been forecast. You can provide comfort to each other while that hurricane is in progress and even after it passes. There should be individuals who you can depend on to stay in contact, you know, even when the winds are howling, even when that hurricane is upon you, 
these people will, can stay in contact so that you don't feel isolated, you don't feel alone and afraid. Uh, they should know where to find your emergency supplies in the event it becomes necessary at some point for them to actually come and assist you. They should know how to operate any uh, medical equipment that you might have, and, and, and they know it should, should have information on how to move you uh, to safety in an emergency. You should jot down the, the name and uh, relationship, the phone number, the email of each individual who is in your uh, support network. Now, there is uh, 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 some literature that is provided by New York City Emergency Management. One is called My Emergency Plan. And with that, you can create your own plan. There is a place where you to you you remember I said jot down the names etc of, of of people uh, your your support network. There's a place in the booklet for you to jot down that information. It's a guide to preparing, a guide to planning, to you know so that you'll have your plan down in writing and it'll be easy to go over it with uh, your family members and loved ones. Now, the uh, <clears throat> for your your uh, emergency support network. Again, as many people as you'd like. Ideally, some of them live close by, so that uh, they have quick and easy access to you if that becomes necessary. But at least one person who lives in a different state entirely. And I, I know that doesn't really add up, you know, how could somebody uh, who lives in Dallas help you here in New York when there's an emergency here? You know, I, I know it doesn't make a lot of sense. I, 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 but in fact, it does make sense. If you remember the last uh, big power failure we had, you remember when, <clears throat> Hurricane Sandy hit, that was devastating. And we lost not only electrical power, but in some areas of the city, we lost communication uh, capability. The uh, cell phones were not working properly. The uh, regular landlines were not working properly for local, for local calls. But if you wanted to call long distance, no problem. You always get right through. So if if Uncle Charles lives in ja in Dallas and Uncle Charles has agreed to be a part of your network with you and and all your family members here and your friends and so forth. You call Uncle Charles and say, Uncle Charles, I can't reach anybody else in the family here in New York City. You know, I call, I get people in all five boroughs, I can't reach any of them. And I can't reach anyone in this borough that I live in. But we can all contact you and you can contact us because long distance service is working. Uncle Charles, <clears throat> excuse me, Uncle Charles, I need you to, uh, when, when uh, our other family members call from New York, let them know that I'm home, I'm, I'm fine, I, you know, I'm, I'm nice and warm, I'm dry, or I'm not okay, I, I, I'm in the hospital, whatever your condition. Uncle Charles can advise your other uh, loved ones where you are and how you're doing. Uncle Charles, I'm gonna call you back and you'll let me know how everyone else is doing when they call in. So that out of town contact becomes extremely valuable because it allows you to remain in touch, even though it's indirectly, it allows you to remain in touch with your loved ones who live here locally in New York City. Now I, I 
always suggest to people that you get yourself a, you know, a, a little 50 cent notebook, little tiny notebooks that you can get at the 99 cent store. And uh, in that notebook, you're gonna jot down uh, your important health and life-saving information, uh, like, you know, the medications that you take, uh, how often you take them. Um, you're going to jot down your, your doctor's name and phone number. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a little horse. <laughs> uh, you're going to jot down the pharmacist's phone number and, and uh, Whatever information, jot down your allergies, um, any, any health and life-saving information about you, you're going to jot that down in that little booklet. You can also include in that booklet the contact information for people in your emergency support network, at least their name and phone number. You know, if there's not enough room for, for all the address and email and all that, no problem, name and phone number would be sufficient. You're gonna jot that down and you're gonna keep that little notebook on your person all the time. Very, very important. Why would you do that? Why is Ed Powell asking us to do that? Write down this uh, health and life-saving information in a notebook our emergency contact uh, information, and keep that on us all the time. Why would you do that? Well, let's suppose, God forbid, something were to happen to you, and you become unconscious. You fall down, you bump your head, and you're unconscious. And someone calls uh, 911, and the ambulance comes. Now, let's stop right there. You're allergic to penicillin, but you don't have this information on you. The ambulance comes, oh, look, he's got a scar on his head where he fell. We better give him a shot of penicillin. Well, you're allergic, but they have no way of knowing that. So look, you have a, uh, an adverse reaction. The other scenario is you do have it, and, and emergency responders are trained to look for something like that on your person, something that will give them information about your health and, and, and well-being, any medications you take, etc. So they find it, they look at, oh, we, we can't give him penicillin, he's allergic. We'll give him something else. So you avoid that adverse reaction. Here's one more reason why you're going to write that information down in a little booklet and keep it with you all the time. Well, during an emergency, people tend to uh, panic a little. Some people a lot, some people a little, but people tend to panic. And in that, that state of mind, it's, it's very difficult to remember detailed information like What's, what's Uncle Charles' area code? Ah, uh, I forgot. They're asking me, uh, the, uh, the emergency um, uh, medical personnel are asking me what medicines I take. And I can't pronounce that. That's the, the names are too long. But you have it in your little booklet. You whip it right out. This is, this is the medicine I take. Or here's Uncle Charles' area code and phone number. Very, very important. During an emergency, especially like hurricanes, it's important to uh, have a meeting place for you and your family to go to. Um, or, you know, if, if someone in the family doesn't show up at the meeting place, then you know, well, we got to go look for that person, or we got to have the authorities uh, look for that person. It's important to establish two meeting places, one nearby and another one a little distance away. 
plan A and plan B. If one is not accessible, then uh, the other one is. <clears throat> Communication is a big part of, of uh, preparedness. It's a big part of your plan. For people who might have challenges to communicating, you want to write down short phrases that can help you in an emergency, uh, like pre-written cards, you know, little index cards or, or text messages. It can help you uh, share information with your support networks or emergency responders during a stressful, uh, uncomfortable situation. You may not have much time to get your messages across. And, and you can jot down phrases like, um, I'm deaf and I use American Sign Language. Or please write down the directions. Or I might have difficulty understanding what you're telling me. Please speak slowly and use simple language or pictures. Or for someone, if you know someone who, who does not speak English, write down on their card, I speak and whatever the language is, Polish, let's say, I speak Polish. I do not speak English. And if you also speak and understand Polish, put your phone number there so that you can interpret. When, when that person shows that card to an emergency responder, then with your phone number there, that emergency responder can call you and you can interpret uh, what the uh, person is saying, as well as what the uh, responder is saying to that person. <clears throat> Transportation should be uh, a huge part of uh, your plan. When uh, very often, when uh, hurricanes or even storms uh, are forecast, um, the, the city's uh, transportation system is put on alert. And uh, quite often, um, there is no problem. But sometimes, during a hurricane, you'll find that transportation systems go out. The buses are not running. The trains are not running. And you should have already prepared by having uh, prearranged with relatives or friends who might have vehicles to come and pick you up if you need to evacuate from your home during that uh, uh, hurricane. You need to evacuate from your home and move to higher ground to some, some friends or neighbors or relatives' home. Then you will need someone to come and drive you there. So prearrange that so that you'll, you'll already have that in place. If in the event that there is no one uh, who you know who has a vehicle, then think about what, how, you're going to, uh, how you're going to move about. Whether you're going to use Lyft or Uber or if you're gonna have a, a private car service uh, phone number, have that information readily available so that you can just put it right into practice and, and move ahead. All right, Matt's going to talk with us now about step number two to preparing, which is gathering supplies. Thanks, Ed. So as Ed mentioned, um, you know, the My Emergency Plan is the main guide that we use for our presentations. And the second section of that booklet talks about gathering supplies. So I'm going to talk about that um, as far as supplies the two methods of gathering supplies is either either going to be a go bag or an emergency supply kit so the go bag is like what it says go you're going you're evacuating so you're going to take a small bag which is going to have supplies for about two to three days so it will either be a small backpack or a bag on wheels and this is going to have supplies again for two to three days if you have to leave if there is a hurricane you have to evacuate you're going to want to have supplies if you're leaving, evacuating to go to family members or friends, or if you're going to the shelter, you want to have enough supplies for that time period. 
some of the supplies that you're going to want to have would be uh, bottled water, snacks that are not going to go bad. So it might be a power bar or granola bar. You want to have enough nutrition um, during you know, an emergency to be able to have enough energy. In addition to that, you want you would need copies of identification cards. And this is up to you. You can provide what you want in your go bag. So there can be a copy of, uh, say, an ID as far as a Medicaid or a Medicare card could be a copy of a passport, could be a copy of a birth certificate. It's really up to you what you want to include. Um, the go bag is personalized to each individual. So in addition to that, you'd wanna have uh, flashlights and extra batteries in case if there is a power outage because of a hurricane, um, you wanna have those things there of flashlight, um, also extra batteries, also having a portable radio, either that uses batteries or one that you can charge. It's a wind up charging radio to, to be able to listen to the news and to know if you do need to evacuate if you live in one of the hurricane evacuation zones that you may need to evacuate. Those might be zones one or two. So if you were in one of those zones, you'd want to evacuate. And again, you would know this by listening to the radio and the news. In addition, other items you'd want to have would be toiletries, um, bar of soap, deodorant, certain items such as that. Also having a portable phone charger because all of us rely so much on our cell phones now, smartphones. So it's important to put the portable charger in your go bag, but also to charge that, which I always forget. So that's mostly important. You need to charge the portable charger. So when you do need to charge your phone, it's there and available. Other items you might want to include would be a pair of shoes if you're going to be doing a lot of walking. Um, in addition to that, other supplies you might want to have related to if you have a disability would be uh, an extra pair of glasses. Um, if you have a previous model of a hearing aid, maybe offering that. Uh, also having an extra cane or extra pair of sunglasses. Uh, if you use a wheelchair, having a tire inflator is always a good thing to have if you use wheelchairs. And also if you have a developmental disability, it's important to have supplies, um, having headphones, music, um, if it's a child, maybe having a comfortable toy that they like to play with that's going to keep them calm during an emergency because it is a stressful time, especially when a hurricane's hitting a city. It's not going to be comfortable for everyone in the shelters. So those are some supplies that you would want to have. Also, cash and small bills, really important. Again, if there is a power outage, you're not going to have access to ATMs. So you should not have anything larger than a $20 bill. Um, so singles, fives, tens, and twenties, in case if you need to purchase supplies, having extra cash will be helpful. And again, there's not going to be access to ATM if there is a power outage. So that's one other thing. And also a couple other things you should include would be a whistle, uh, which is one way we can only shout for so long and raise our voice. So it's one way we can actually inform people. It's not going to contact first responders, but it's going to be able, if someone else is in the building, they'll hear that whistle and know that you need help. And finally, a medication, if you can provide extra medication, have all that, all that information written down, that's something, you know, if you go to the shelter and you have to show someone that I need this type of medication, that's something you'd wanna have in your go bag too. Now go bags specifically, you know, items may go bad when you, if you say, if you do go through a hurricane and you use supplies, or even if you don't go through a hurricane, um, every hurricane season, every season in general, you check your go bag. So, Usually we recommend right, saving time, checking the go bag at least twice a year yeah. to see if supplies are, are good or not. So the supplies, you'd want to again, check them twice a year. And as I mentioned, the go bag is personalized. So everyone in the household is going to need a go bag, especially pets or service animals too. So those supplies are going to be for everyone in the household. Um, for pets and service animals, some things you'd want to have would be a copy of veterinary uh, information for your service animal or pet, um, having a copy of picture in case pets go missing, and also having extra water, snacks, a blanket, having all those things for your pet or service animal. Um, I myself, I have a service animal, so those are some things that I include in my go bag. So those are some supplies for going, and then again, that's evacuating if there is a hurricane that you need to evacuate. If you are going to shelter in place if you feel more comfortable sheltering in place if you feel it's safe to do that then you're one you're going to want to have supplies for up to seven days it may seem like a lot but you may be stuck in a certain location for some time so um, you want to have certain items 
like a gallon of water per person per day. So if it was a week's worth of water, you'd want to have seven, seven gallons of water if it was one individual. So you want to have a gallon of water per person per day in the household. You also want to need, you want to have canned food and a manual can opener. If again, if there's no power, you won't be able to cook your food. So that's one way to have um, nutrition, especially if you're going to be there for set up to seven days. In addition to those supplies, you're going to want to have a first aid kit, flashlights and batteries, having toiletries, um, having, again, some supplies that are similar to a go bag, but for the emergency supply kit, they're going to be in a larger supply. So again, like I mentioned, flashlights, first aid kit, having a radio, having those extra supplies. And if you do have a disability or other access and functional need, you want to include items in your supply kit also for that too. So again, the main difference, a go bag is if you're evacuating and a sh an, an emergency supply kit is if you're sheltering in place. So one is going and one is staying. That's the main difference between the two types of supplies you're going to gather. Now, the third section of the My Emergency Plan is about staying informed. New York City has a program called Notify NYC, which we provide, it's a free program to all New Yorkers that can sign up for it. And this um, program provides alerts either through a text message, a cell phone, or a landline. You can sign up for up to five zip codes for emergencies, and you can opt in and opt out of certain messaging. So the messages can go from that there's no transportation to that there is a hurricane that may hit the city. Um, for hurricane purposes, we will provide um, messaging way before the storm. So messaging will talk about that a hurricane may hit the city, and then once it gets closer, we'll provide more preparedness tips, and that will be through Notify NYC. Um, other things that we provide through that um, app would be if there's cooling centers opening, service centers opening, so there's some other additional things. But for this presentation specifically, um, hurricanes is what we're focusing on. That's what's going to be provided through that app. And also the, the signing up through 311 or through our website. We do have an app that's free of charge you can sign up for that will track um, your location. So um, that's important for emergencies. And specifically, the messaging that we provide is in up to 13 different languages and also provided in American Sign Language. So um, we want to provide messaging accessibly to all New Yorkers, so that's one way that we have that. In addition to Notify NYC, we have the Ready NYC app, and that is similar to the Ready NYC, the My Emergency Plan. So that app actually allows someone to make a plan, to gather supplies, and finally to stay informed. Um, within an app, there is um, options where you can write in your contacts, your meeting places. There's a checklist you can go through to add in certain items that you would have in your go bag. And then finally, it talks about staying informed and some additional programs that we have, such as the Life Sustaining Equipment Program, um, where one can contact either Con Edison or PSEG, their utility company, uh, for to see if they are a Life Sustaining Equipment customer. So. Again, Notify NYC and Ready NYC, those are the two apps that we have. Um, in addition to that, our Ready New York guides, the My Emergency Plan, and also other guides such as our Pets Preparedness Guide and numerous other guides are available on our website, nyc.gov slash emergency management. And uh, in addition to that too, our guides are offered in audio format for those who are blind and low vision and have developmental disabilities. Um, people can find more information about hurricanes if they go to our website, Again, that's nyc.gov slash emergency management. So Ed's going to talk about our social media campaign and also some upcoming events. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, well, we encourage you to be a part of our social media campaign, sharing the steps that New Yorkers can take to prepare for emergencies. As a part of uh, this campaign, we would like to feature you and your emergency plan on our social media channels uh, and uh, all New Yorkers who are featured on our social media channels will be mailed a free go bag. A free go bag. I like to repeat that. If you're interested in participating, please send a, a one to three photos and a little descriptive captions that include some personal details about you and your, your plan and how you are preparing for emergencies. 
make a note to submit your entry now in order to be considered. Uh, okay, if you have any uh, additional questions, uh, feel free to email readyny at oem.nyc.gov. And I'm going to ask Kevin to please put that uh, in into the chat as well, so people will uh, so it will be available to everyone. Uh, just a, a quick notes about upcoming events um, on September 24th. Uh, we'll have voices of uh, the the uh, disabled uh, emergency preparedness. This is a presentation uh, primarily for people who. Uh, are disabled. September 24th, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. On September 26th, from 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., a quick little uh, emergency preparedness uh, program for children. And on uh, September 29th, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., Emergency preparedness for older adults in a COVID-19 world. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to just go to, to, to our website, nyc.gov.readyny, and you can get further details on that. And you can get uh, more information on everything we've talked about. You can also uh, download a copy of my emergency plan uh, through which you can make your own plan. And everyone's plan should be individual, should be uh, personal. You can make your own personal emergency plan. So uh, at this point, uh, we're gonna open up to questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, Kevin, we have any uh, questions in the chat? Hi, I'm Matt. Yes, there is a couple questions. Uh, the first question is from Susan Rosen, Rosenhall, Rosendahl, uh, Masala. Uh, she asked, what would, what would the plan be for a senior who is totally bedridden and, and may need to be evacuated? Call an ambulance? Where can that person be moved? Matt, I'm going to ask you to take that one. Okay. So um, for people with disabilities, um, that is what you're talking about. There is a program that they can um, contact through 301, the homebound evacuation operation, if they're in, um, in a zone, if they have difficulty evacuating. That's uh, one program they can call 311. And what the representative will do is ask specific questions. And like you're saying, if the person is um, unable to get out of bed, that would be one option where um, that either the fire department or EMS, they would take them to um, the options for transportation, it's either an accessible evacuation center or to a hospital. So depending on the person's needs, they would be routed to either of those two places, not to an individual's home or apartment or residence, but to those two locations. So um, again, it's it's having that in mind, but also again, like thinking, in, like we've talked about having, having a plan, um, the person, if that's there, if they have a disability and thinking about beforehand, okay, how am I going to evacuate? So Again, reaching out to the supports if they don't have individuals in the city, there might be certain service providers that would provide assistance. Um, so again, it's up to the person. If, if they have those additional needs, they're gonna think that through. And again, you know, using the transportation assistance through the city, um, if they need to evacuate, and also, again, the fire department and also EMS would be involved. Um, as far as, you know, reaching out to the fire department or EMS beforehand, that's always a good thing to do too. If someone has a disability to let them know, you know, if there is an emergency, I might need extra help. So those, those are things to, to consider. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we have, we have any uh, additional questions, Kevin? Yes, another question that I received is, um, hello, some of my, um, some of my seniors that I work with may be undocumented. Are these shelters open for all people? The shelters are open for all people. Yeah, we, we don't ask documentation status. And again, like I mentioned, we're gonna accept all New Yorkers, um, you know, if they're undocumented, you know, any, you're not gonna, you know, ask, ask for documentation. 
Um, and again, like I mentioned before, too, if someone has a disability or other, other needs, again, we're not going to ask for documentation. Um, we want everyone to be safe during a hurricane and coastal storm. Thank you. Thank you um, so another question is from Marlene Van Cleve, uh, and it is asking if, if she, she can get a copy of the presentation. Um, Marlene, yes, you may get a copy of the presentation. If you can email us at readyny at oem.nyc.gov, which is on which is on the screen right now to request it, we'll be able to get you a PDF format of the presentation as well as uh, a video um, copy of the presentation that can be made online and be accessible through our National Preparedness Month webpage. Okay, are there, are there any additional questions? Um, I don't see any. Um, okay. We can give it another 30 to 60 seconds. Um, okay, okay. In the meantime, while we're waiting, uh, let me just reiterate. Uh, we have so many materials available. Uh, you know, everything that we've gone over in this presentation as well as many, many other things. You know, we have videos on uh, emergency preparedness. We have uh, uh, audio, it, just about anything you can imagine uh, on how to prepare for emergencies. And you can access that by just going to nyc.gov slash readyny. You'll find a wealth of uh, information on emergency preparedness. And to add to that too, on, on that site, there is also a way you can request if you want us to do additional presentations, um, hurricane presentations, that is something that we, our office does. And in addition on that site, there are also other links to um, specific sections like pets and service animals, people with disabilities, children, so different talking points and different things um, that we provide for those populations is on, on the website um, for all New Yorkers, because we want to, you know, obviously provide education to all New Yorkers and um, the guys like Ed mentioned are there, the My Emergency Plan, the Pets Preparedness Guide. There's also uh, the Ready Girl comic book. There's many supplies on there, you know, videos, guides, even the Ready New York City app, um, the Notify and Ready NYC app, it talks about how to download the app on that page too. Okay, okay, well, if there are no additional questions, uh, uh, you know, if you think of something, uh, uh, you know, after we're gone, jot down the, uh, the email address on the screen and just email your question to us and we'll, we'll provide an answer for you. Uh, I, we sincerely hope that uh, you've gotten at least a little something uh, from this presentation that will cause you to think about uh, preparing for emergencies. And the time to do that is today. Don't wait till tomorrow because you'll, you'll, you won't do it. Trust me. You'll say, oh, I, well, it's not important. So, I, there was actually a couple more questions. Um, okay. I could just answer them and I'll read it out for everyone. Uh, one of the questions is, is this material provided in different languages? Uh, this material is provided in different languages. Uh, and these presentation, uh, and we do have these lang um, these materials in different languages on our website. Uh, if you do want to request it, please email us at readyny at oem.nyc.gov. Uh, and Matt, uh, and Ed and Matt, another question is: Are you going to have another presentation on this topic uh, at an early an hour? Uh, at an earlier hour? Uh, we can do that. We can certainly do that. Uh, just just provide that request to us in writing to the email address that's on the screen, and we'll do our best to accommodate you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Ed. Uh, also, our presentations can be found online at our website at ready and um, at nyc.gov slash NPM and all of our previous presentations and events that we've done for the month 
for uh, the month of September can be found there. Uh, and these are great. They're linked on YouTube, uh, and we hope that you enjoyed those as well. Okay, thanks everyone for, for, for joining us. Uh, be safe, uh, uh, keep, keep safe. <laughs> hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great night.